You're listening to The Wise Woman Podcast, Episode 6. I'm your host, Alicia Wilford, founder of Yoke and Abundance, a leadership, life, and creativity coaching business. This podcast is designed to inspire by introducing you to creative women living abundantly. Today, we're doing things a little differently. I hope you'll enjoy today's episode where we turn the tables and you hear from me. For those of you who've been following along, I've been thinking you might have some really big questions about this podcast. Today, I do my best to answer your questions about why this podcast came about, who I am, and what yoke and abundance is. I sincerely hope this episode will answer your questions, and if it doesn't, please shoot me an email and let me know what you're still curious about. Now for a word from our sponsor. Today's sponsor is Social Designs. Social Designs specializes in leadership and diversity consulting and training. On Friday, September 21st, in partnership with Deftable and Professional Business Cultures, Social Designs is hosting The Bloom, Innovation Solutions for Inclusion, a seminar from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Greensboro, North Carolina. I personally attended the Design and Create Diversity 101 training with Social Designs, and it was incredible. I left with tools that I applied immediately here at Yoke and Abundance. Their training methods definitely exemplify the company motto, we are a catalyst for growth. Visit bloominclusion.com to register for the September 21st seminar. So the tables are turned today, and I have Whitney Brooks sitting down with me for the Wise Woman podcast. And Whitney, you'll hear from her later in the season, pretty soon, as a matter of fact. She is actually going to interview me, Alicia Wilford, today. Yeah, and the reason why I wanted you to interview me is because... I'm pretty sure the audience might like to know a little bit more about what Yoke and Abundance is, what my background is, and why I've decided to put this podcast out into the world. And I'm not yet the type of podcaster that wants to sit down alone with a microphone and talk to people. So I brought in one of my favorite people to help me share this message. So Whitney, you're going to drive the bus on this for the whole rest of the interview. Well, let's put it in gear and go because as you said, I'm sure your audience has all sorts of questions they want to get in your mind, in your brain. And I do too, because I have questions that I've been dying to ask you since I met you. So uh, this is a great kind of, you know, I mean, selfishly, I'm like, woohoo, I get to get in Alicia's head a little bit and share it with everyone who's listening. So I'm really excited. Um, for myself. (laughs) Excited for you and excited for all your listeners. So this is going to be fun. Thank you. I would, in the spirit of turning the tables and kind of literally in this instance, I know that you like to start off your episodes by having your guest pull an animal spirit card. Yes. So today, would you like to pull a card? I would. I'm grinning from ear to ear because I rarely pull them for myself, which I think people might be a little bit surprised to know, but I almost never do it unless I'm writing my morning pages, which I do almost every morning and I'm feeling really stuck and need a little bit of inspiration. So I would love an animal spirit card. I would love an animal spirit card. Yes, please. Okay, so we'll start by placing your hands on the deck. Okay. And I'm going to help out a little. Okay. So close your eyes. Take three deep breaths. And when you finish, simply open your eyes and then cut that deck. And turn your card over. Ooh, the otter. The otter. I know what this is. I'm gonna I would love for you to read what it is, but I know the otter is a creature of the water, and water represents our emotional worlds mm-hmm. and it represents our flow and our creativity, so to speak. Um, and 
in one of the very few times recently that I have pulled myself a card, I've actually gotten the otter. And so, yeah. So this is a repeat for you. Yeah, and it makes me wonder if it's, um, if someone's trying to tell me something. Hmm. A question for you is that I noticed when you flipped this card over and said, oh my gosh, I've pulled this before. You're grinning from ear to ear. Yeah. What's that all about? The otter's about joy. Hmm. Okay, here we go with the otter. Takes into account unobstructed joy, playfulness, and contentment. Perhaps the most joyful creature within the animal spirit deck, the otter represents absolute bliss. Otter energy is the playfulness of a child available to us at any age. They have a giddiness and reverence for life itself without the presence of doubt, worry, or skepticism. Imagine yourself with a little more otter energy. What would life look like? What would it take to bring you there? The Otter card begs these questions and it wants to transport us to that precious place as soon as possible. The celebration awaits. It says that when this, when the Otter is in balance, it is full of love and it needs nothing. And when it's out of balance, gloomy sighs make silly excuses. And to bring into balance, Ooh, dance party or celebration? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can make a dance party happen. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at these questions. What would life look like if you had a little more otter energy? Yeah, so, you know, what I think this is pointing to for me is being an entrepreneur is not for the faint of heart. So being an entrepreneur is difficult and I just want to be really real with the folks listening to this and that entrepreneurship, um, especially from a financial perspective, has been probably one of the most tenuous decisions that I've ever made. And from that perspective, it's really difficult. So since I've gotten this card twice in the past two months, maybe, I think that what it's trying to tell me is that wherever we are in life, it's your choice to bring in joy. Mm -hmm. And that even if things are really difficult, you have a choice as to what your perspective is. And I might have been on the phone with my mom in tears last night, being not the nicest human being. And that was a choice, and my choice could have been to be kinder and more joyful. Just because hard things are happening doesn't mean that we have to walk around with a cloud over our heads. Mm -hmm. So that's what that card, I think, is trying to tell me. Entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. And yet, even in that sort of maybe instability, we still have the option to choose kindness, seek joy, and let that play out in our everyday lives and our relationships and carrying on with others. Yes, and it's what I would tell clients. So I need to take mm. my own advice. Little sip of your own medicine yeah. there. It's always the hardest to do as a coach. <laughs> yes. Let me take a peek in that mirror. Yes. Looking back at the animal spirit deck. Yeah. I would like to know, and I think your readers or your clients might like to know, why the animal spirit cards? Mm. Thank you for asking that question because I think this goes back to my life in the corporate world you know I got out of college and I worked for the fresh market which is how you and I met mm -hmm. um, and I worked for the fresh market starting after my sophomore year in college worked for there for a number of years worked my way up and then went into Lincoln went into a very corporate environment that environment that was suits and ties and high heels and I have often walked a very fine line it's like I was straddling two worlds. I was straddling the world of my previous self of this this hippie girl, kind of hippie girl that went, I was always straddling two worlds. At 
Guilford College, I was a bit of a hippie. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I got there, I found out that I wasn't a hippie because there were true hippies that went there. Like, I like to shave my armpits and take a bath on a regular basis and things like that. So maybe I wasn't full-on Guilford hippie, but I felt a little bit more corporate in the hippie world. And then when I went into corporate America, I felt way more hippie than I did corporate. So I feel like I've, I've always been on this fence, like really straddling a fence between two worlds. And so much of me has always embraced, let's call it the more liminal space of life. That place where there's magic and mystery and enchantment. And I want to bring the possibility of magic and intuition into a space with my clients and with the folks on the podcast as well. You know, it does other things, which I talk about on the podcast. It also brings in fun and icebreaker and gives you a different lens to look at where you are in life. But I think if you let it, you can tap into your intuition. Mm -hmm. And maybe a way to infuse a little joy. Yes. Hello, Mr. Otter, Ms. Otter a little slice of joy into the vision of your client. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking that question. You're welcome. Speaking of the corporate world, you you just talked about making that switch from uh, suited corporate America to what you're doing now. What can you tell us about what you're doing now and how that rose up out of what you were doing before? What's that journey been like? The journey from security, the journey out of subsidized health insurance, the journey out of structure that's provided by someone else, the journey out of playing by somebody else's rules. So that's maybe some of the things that I found helpful and difficult. Mm And then the journey into creating my own structure, creating my own workshops and curriculum and programs. It's been messy. Messy. Messy is the only way I can describe it. We often have an idea that the grass is greener and I was under no illusion that it would be easy. I had owned a yoga studio. I knew that was hard. I know what it I knew what it was going to be like to start a business from scratch to some extent. But I don't think I was as prepared to understand how well my experiences in corporate America were preparing me for how hard it would be in the entrepreneur world and so I'm really grateful for that it's been really eye-opening to see how much support I have in the community behind me in a really positive way because that was even though the company that I worked for did a great job of taking care of me as an employee I always saw myself as other from from that Department, Not because they made me feel like I was other, but I was other. And doing the work that I'm doing now, I get to build a community. I get to make sure that I'm bringing people together and doing whatever I can to make people feel included. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there's a tapestry that's being knit, and I'm a thread in that tapestry and I'm an integral thread in that tapestry and it's the first time in my life that I've felt this supported by the folks around me like I can ask for help and it's given I can say I'm having a problem and people want to brainstorm and help me fix that problem and that's new and different and wonderful. And so that's been the biggest learning thing to me is understanding that not only do I have a supportive community around me, I've 
been an integral part in, in building that community. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty amazing safety net. I thought that I would jump and there wouldn't be a net, and there is. The net is there. The net is there. It might not be comfortable on how you access it, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Speaking of discomfort, you mentioned a moment ago that being in the corporate world, you felt different from your coworkers, from your team, from the environment there. And I think that sometimes when we're in a situation like that, it helps highlight what our comfort zone is, what our discomfort zone is, what we're good at, what we're not as good at. So now that you're in an environment where you, you know, you've created the environment, you're weaving the tapestry, how are you figuring out what you're good at, what you're not as good at, since that highlight might not be there as visible, visibly? I think it's the highlight of what you're good at and what you're not good at becomes more visible as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So the areas that you have weaknesses, the areas that you need to grow, the areas that you are really struggling with get amplified in a way that they are not amplified. So when I talk about being an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship not being for the faint of heart, if you're not someone that's really willing to do the self work if you're someone that's not willing to look at what isn't working, or if you're not, if you are someone that likes to stick your head in the stand or just scoot by, that's impossible in entrepreneurship. You have to address the problems head on or you're not gonna make it. I mean, sometimes in the corporate world, you see folks, um, there are a lot of people who work really hard in the corporate world, so I don't want to be down on the corporate world completely, but it wasn't a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I could see is, you know, the people that come in and they're just phoning it in. You cannot do that in entrepreneurship. You can't just phone in. You can't do the work and turn off for the day and go home. I mean, I live in my work, so literally I get my office and my home are the same thing, so I can't turn off. There's a big whiteboard in my office um, where I have what motivates me or what my to-dos are on a regular basis, and I see it as soon as I wake up. I see it every time I walk through the office. I see it when I'm in my office and before I go to bed at night. And here we are recording in your lovely dining room. Yes. I think people might find really interesting to know. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a fancy recording studio I mean, you'll often hear on this podcast the chairs creaking, like I'll try to make it creak now, and we've got rain, which you can probably hear. Um, so yeah, that's just part of it. Um, I think of um, the phrase, you know, entrepreneurship is real life happening in real time. Yeah. That it's right there front and center. Yes. Which you know because you're an entrepreneur as well. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Dining room and all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we'll jump right into your coaching company, which is called Yoke and Abundance. Yes. As your readers probably know. Yes. I'm saying readers, your clients. Um, what Listeners. Your listeners. What is Yoke and Abundance? Great question. Yoke and Abundance started as a blog. And it was before I knew that I was going to be started, before I knew that it was gonna be a coaching company, to be honest. Although I did have it on the website that I offered mentoring programs. I remember that. Yeah, and I picked the name Yoke because yoga means to yoke. And at the time, I still owned my yoga studio, and yogic philosophy is really a part of who I am and how I choose to be in the world and how I choose to operate. I wouldn't call it, for me, a religion, but it is a way of being, and it's a philosophy that I try to live my life by. And that doesn't mean that I do the physical practice asana every day, but it does mean that I, I try to do no harm. It means that I try to look inward. Um, those philosophies, I think, are really important. The getting quiet piece, I think, is really important. Meditating on a daily basis. So I knew that yoke was going to be a part of it. And then the other part is that 
you know, I've always struggled personally with feeling like I have lack in my life. And it was extraordinarily important to me to think about what I wanted. And what I want is an abundance, abundance of community that love me, who I love, an abundance of financial prosperity, an abundance of work that I love. And I believe from uh, in living from your life from a place of abundance. So that's where Yoke and Abundance was born. And I was working with a coach recently and she said to me, oh, I think it's so brilliant that you named your company Yoke and Abundance as a coach because yoke can be such a negative connotation. We all have a yoke is the yoke of an oxen, not the yoke of an egg, which you know because you have a yoga background as well, but I think so often when you hear the word yoke and you think egg, but yoga, yoke is really the yoke that goes over two oxen or two horses. The bridge. To, the bridge to plow a field, um, to the tool you use to accomplish a task. And it really... Shameen Taylor Smith, I just want to do a shout out to her, really, you know, helped to bring this to the forefront of my mind that we all have a yoke we carry. And what I'm trying to do in yoga is help women find, and some men too, I do work with some men, assist and hold up the mirror and share with the person sitting across the table with me that you get to choose the yoke. Yes, we all have to have a yoke, but you get to choose the yoke. So that's where the name yoke and abundance comes from. And the other part of that is the abundance end of it. You know, when I was owned my yoga studio, another yoga studio opened not even a mile down the road six months after I opened. They had a bigger budget. They had, you know, more money to start with. They were very well connected in the community and the way I was not connected within the community. And let me be clear that as business owners, we are 100% responsible for the success or failure of our own businesses. And I knew that, and I knew that I had that these were feelings of jealousy and fear and lack, and I felt shame for feeling feelings of jealousy, fear, and lack. And I was angry at myself because, again, it goes back to that abundance. I want to live from a place of abundance that there is more than enough to go around. And that's where the Wise Woman Wednesday column was born from, is that I believed that I could teach myself a lesson. You know, In positive psychology, we talk about how feelings are not wrong or bad. So those feelings that I had, and if you ever have feelings of jealousy or fear or lack, they're not wrong, they're not bad, but getting stuck in them is. So if, you, if I were to try to push them down and say, you can't have this feeling, it's like that, like it's like being in a pool and laying over a beach ball and trying to hold that peach ball down. It's just going to pop up even higher the next time. The further you try to push that down, the higher up it's going to bounce. And, and I knew that. So I knew that I needed to have a way to let those feelings sit and float on the surface without me trying to push them down. And so I knew I needed to teach myself a lesson. And I just thought about how many women in my world were up to big, courageous, beautiful things. And I knew that if I were to highlight them and celebrate them on a regular basis, that I would be able to teach myself a lesson, that I would be able to hold space for the abundance and hold space for all of the yoga studios in town and all of the yoga studios that are going to open in town and all of the businesses that I might see as quote unquote competition and that's where the yoke and abundance was born. The Wise Woman Wednesday was born out of the yoke and abundance piece. And speaking of your Wise Woman Wednesday features on your blog. Yes. And getting, staying with this idea of, uh, you know, some jealousy, frustration, and anger, and how so often women today, you know, there's this, um, 
I don't know that I believe there's a whole lot of truth in it, but there's this myth of the idea of all women feeling a sense of competition with one another. Mm. And a very real thing is the sense of women not realizing their self-worth. Yes. And early on when you were working on your blog, I remember you sharing with me that almost every single time that you approach someone about being a feature on the blog, that the response was, why me? I'm not anything special. Yeah. I don't know that, you know, and that went as far as to say, I don't know that you really should feature me. Yeah, it, it, yes, and that still happens. And um, I just like tingled all over my body when you said that because it's been amplified for me recently in a few different ways. Women and the idea of self-worth and I can put myself in this category too, which I think people would be surprised to hear. But I think so much of the work that I do as a coach comes down to self-worth and how we view our personal self-worth. I just, you know, it's the end of August. I think this will be airing next week, the beginning of September. I have in the last month worked with 60 women in my trying to work with 100 women campaign um, in the month. And I think that as many as 75% of the women I worked with have some sort of feeling of lack of worth. Whether they'll say it in those specific words or not, You know, there's that Marianne Williamson quote that our fear is not that we are inadequate. Our our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And I think that that's almost true with a caveat. We are afraid that our small self, our ego self, is not worthy but i think that if we could lift the veil of the ego we would see that we are truly powerful beyond measure but so many of us are stuck in that ego self that we don't realize that we are trying to prove something to ourselves and others Mm -hmm. and all of the striving is never going to prove anything to anyone So my greatest hope is that the work that I'm doing, and I try to do all the work that I assign to other people as well, but the greatest hope that I, that I have for my clients is that they'll see that they are worthy of whatever they want. And as long as they are in alignment with what's most important to them truly, that they are worthy of that. Did I answer the question? You did. And your listeners may have other additional thoughts on that or additional questions that they'd want to know even more about that. You know, I, I would say it just breaks my heart every time I ask a woman if she'll do a Wise Woman Wednesday interview and she asks why me. Because mm-hmm. I think the greater question is why not me? Like all of the women I haven't gotten to yet all of us have seeds of wisdom to share all of us have a dream that we're harboring or something to offer other people and i often talk about how there's a robert ingersoll quote that i live my life by and it's we rise by lifting others and by sharing your truth by sharing your wisdom you rise by lifting others because whatever it is that you've gone through is something that someone else out there has gone through as well. I mean, we just saw it amplified in the Me Too movement. And by women sharing their stories, they were able to rise by lifting others. And I, and I don't believe that we're all in competition, that women are in some, you mentioned earlier the, that there's a thought, a pervasive thought that women are always in competition with one another. And I think that we might have these slivers of fear and these slivers of jealousy, but I, I believe that overall, we really actually want to help one another. 100% agree. 
and it's just the masculine energy i think that that sometimes when we get out of balance there's feminine and masculine energy within all of us and i think sometimes when we get out of balance with that masculine energy and it takes over i think that's where the competition and the jealousy and the fear comes in so we need to look within and find out why there's an imbalance mm. I love that thought. Looking looking inside, what's out of balance? And people come and work with you to figure out exactly what that is and how to bring it back into balance. Right. That's the yoking. Yes. Bridging that gap. Yeah, absolutely. So as long as I've known you, you have been this beautiful creative being. And I think of creativity just at the core of everything you do. So I'm wondering how you define creativity and how it plays a role in your life. Maybe even your work. I define creativity as the expression of everything I do. And that my greatest hope is that everyone will define creativity that way as well. Because if you define creativity as the expression of everything you do, then you can own the fact that you're a creative being. And I do believe that all of us are creative beings. From, you know, none of us would be here if our parents had not done a creative act. Amen. I mean, I could go into more detail there, but I don't <laughs> think it's necessary. But, you know, the desire, the coming together of two beings is an act of creation. How we choose to worship for those of us that are more spiritual or religious is an act of creativity. You look around outside and the trees that exist are born from the creation of something. Everything around us is born from creativity. So that's my definition of creativity. What's the second part of that question? How creativity plays a role in your life. Creativity plays a role in my life in everything I do from when I get up in the morning to write my morning pages and the way the, the journal that I've picked to write in, the way I curate my morning, drinking a cup of very particular, a French pressed cup of coffee with my beans from the farmer's market. Shout out to my friend, Michael. <laughs> who roasts the most incredible Guatemalan blend and he would scold me for putting my Guatemalan beans in the French press. He does anytime I bring it up. But just those those small things in our life, the way we curate our life, the way we choose to express ourselves is creation. You know, even accountants are creative especially sometimes accountants are creative. You can be creative in whatever it is that you're doing. And I think that when you're passionate about something, creativity is automatically born of that passion. Maybe a year and a half ago, you can mention the timeline here. You wrote one of my favorite blog posts. I've been dying to ask you about this or really? talk to you about this because this was an instance of uh, Alicia keeping it really real, even when your readers, I don't think, wanted you to. You wrote a blog post about closing your yoga studio. And specifically, you used the F word. I failed. <laughs> you said it. I failed. Yeah. And it was so interesting that the comments that came below that post were, you didn't fail, you just took a sidestep. You didn't fail, you just tried something different and it didn't quite work out. Blah, 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 blah. And every single time you responded, no, I failed. You're just putting a different word to it. What is so wrong with, one, the word fail, and two, the act of failing? Why are we so just adamantly, mm. energetically opposed to that and I love the way you carried like you really owned that yeah and so I'm wondering 
what is up with people being so afraid of this whole idea of failure? Right. It's huge. It's huge. There's so many layers to this question. I really appreciate you asking it. My goal in opening a yoga studio, I wish that I could tell you it was to build community and that it was all of these ultra and to spread the love of yoga. Yes, I mean, those were side things that I hoped would happen. I wanted to make money. I wanted to quit my corporate job. I wanted to have a sustainable career in something else. That to me was what success looked like. That was my goal. Did I achieve those things? No, and I lost a lot of money doing it. Therefore, I consider that a failure. Now, did I learn a lot in that experience? Yes, and absolutely, absolutely I learned and I grew from that. But if you don't fail, you don't learn. So if you can't own the fact that it's a failure, how can you learn from it? That's why I'm so adamant about calling things by name. Words are important and being true to what happened is important. And that's the truth of what happened in that situation. That studio under my reins, under my control, was not financially abundant in the way that I had hoped that it would be. And I sure as hell hope that that's different under its current reins. And I think it is, I don't know. Um, I go sub a class there every once in a while. It seems like there's a ton of people in the studio and that's great. And I want nothing but success for those that are running that studio now. But it's important to own failure. Sarah Blakely tells, she's the owner of Spanx. There's a podcast op episode on how I built this. I'm a huge consumer of podcasts, and I think that if you're gonna start a podcast, you probably have to be a huge consumer of podcasts. But Sarah Blakely, who is the owner of Spanx, built a multi-million dollar business with Spanx. And I believe she was telling, I think she was talking to Guy Raz on how I built this, that in her household, Every day they had to come home and tell their dad how they'd failed that day. And the failure was celebrated because it meant that they had tried. So I want to own the fact that I failed because it meant that I tried. So even if I feel some shame in the failing, I can feel buoyed by the fact that I tried. And not everybody does that. And I would rather have the the shame of feeling like I failed as opposed to the feeling of regret. Mm -hmm. The shame of feeling like you failed and not feeling regret. And you know, it's interesting when we talk about failure, it's almost like there's this end cap on it. I failed, that's it. And then I'm afraid to talk about what else is beyond that. Yeah. Same thing with fear. You know, yes. there's a wall that goes up. So, you were an entrepreneur early on. You took the risk, you opened the yoga studio, it failed, you're still at Lincoln, you're no longer at Lincoln, and now you have your own coaching business. So I think that let's carry through this idea, fear, failure, and we talk about failing forward in coaching and how we fail, we make the mistake, just like you said, we, we learn from that. Right. So I'd love to hear what you are taking from that failure with the yoga studio and using to fuel your coaching business with Yoke and Abundance. I would say that one of my clear messages to clients is to try, to go after what it is that you want to go after. And I am by no means recommending that everyone quit their corporate job because there's tremendous amount of risk in that. Risk that I face on a daily basis. And I would never wanna be responsible for lighting someone's fire to do that and then having them think it was the worst decision they had ever made. So I want them, I want people to go after what they want, eyes wide open, mm -hmm. and I want them to be ready to embrace the failure 
and know that that's a part of the process and it's okay and it's an important part of the process and to set themselves up for success and failure in such a way that they can learn and recover from the experience. And maybe even being set up for failure is, I don't want to say it's more important than being set up for success, but getting comfortable with that idea yes, and not pretending that it's not an option right. because it's an option for everyone. Yeah. I, you know, Tim Ferriss talks about fear setting and it's a stoic principle of think getting real comfortable. The way we goal set, you fear set. So think about the things that you are most afraid of. Worst case scenario, write those things down. And then after you wrote, write those things down, if that happens, what are the steps that you could take to repair the damage? And what are the steps that you could take to keep you from going all the way there? And I think that no matter how big or small your fears are, fear setting is an important part of the process, just like goal setting is. Totally agree. And there's this idea that uh, fear is fear is a way of something trying to get our attention. Yes. And I wrote another blog post about fear being the signal that you probably need to move towards something. I mean, it's not like the majority of us live in a forest in Africa where, or desert in Africa where lions are going to be chasing us and fear is a signal that you might die. Most of us, fear is a signal that there's something to pay attention to that you actually need to move into because there's a lesson for you. Get on board. Yep. It might be the Titanic, but you might need that lesson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look for the life jacket before it's too late. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Have an escape plan. So I'm wondering, what inspires you? Hmm. Where do you Where do you find space to grab energy? So there's the little things and then there's the big things. We want to hear it all. Okay. <laughs> so morning pages inspire me. I mean, I do them almost every day, minimum five days a week. And I glean inspiration from getting quiet and leaving room for the magic when I'm writing those morning pages. I get inspired through exercise. Seems like such a weird thing to say, but going for a run and sweating and knowing that I accomplished a hard thing that I might not have wanted to do when I was lacing up and might not have enjoyed when I was doing while I was out there, but that feeling of accomplishment. And I'm always able to work something out in my head when I go for a run. So that creates space for me and helps inspire me to keep me going so it's a way of inspiring myself and then I'm really really inspired when I hear stories of women succeeding and that's why I share stories of women succeeding or not succeeding because coming back to that idea and theme of we rise by lifting others, other people's stories, knowing that you're not alone, knowing that somebody's gone and done it, someone's paved the way, that's inspiring. Is there a story or an instance from way back when that, that jump-started all this for you? Maybe even pre-college, pre-high school? You know, I really love children's books. I have this almost irrational love of children's books that many people don't know about me because 
I mean, I like my friends' kids and all, and I like family members' kids, but, like, kids are not necessarily my thing. But I love children's books, and I think that I love them so much because in some ways they shape who we are. You get a book that's telling a story of somebody who's done something great in the world. And there was a book by Barbara Cooney, and it's called Miss Rumpus, and I call it the Lupine Lady, and it's the story of a little girl in the 1800s, and she lives in Maine by the sea with her grandparents, and she, her grandfather's a painter, and they live by the sea, and he had traveled the world, and she tells her grandfather, I want to be just like you. I want to travel the world, and I want to live by the sea. And he says, that's fine and good, little Alice, but you must also do something to make the world more beautiful. And so she is this single woman in the mid-1800s off adventuring, and it didn't matter if there was another man in her life or not. There was no man in the book. She went and traveled the world, which I believe travel is a really, really important piece to self-development and growth. And then she went to live by the sea, and I feel a really deep connection personally with the sea, which is interesting because I did not actually physically step foot in the ocean until I was 19. I did not see the ocean or smell the salt air of the ocean until I was 19, but I've always felt this affinity with it. And then she decides that the thing that she's, she finally figures out that the thing that she's gonna do, she loves lupines after she travels the world, she gets hurt getting off of a camel and decides that it's time to live by the sea and she's laid up and she had planted outside of her windows lupines and they come up and then when she gets better in the springtime, she's walking and she sees that lupines had come up in the valley and she realized that the wind had carried the seeds and that it was because of her. So she orders bushels and bushels of these seeds and she spreads them all over. And that book has been an anthem, I believe, for the life I'm living. And that has inspired me. And I want women to go after their dreams and I want them to make it happen. And I don't want them to think that they need a, a partner in their life in order to make those dreams happen. And I want I want to make the world a more beautiful place. And maybe I live by the sea too. I don't know. I'm pretty keen on Greensboro at the moment, but I do love the sea so much and feel a deep connection with the water and the waves and think that that's an important thing. But that book has been so inspiring in my life. Um, so yes, that is something that has inspired me deeply. Now I really understand why you pulled the otter card. <laughs> yes. All the water inspiration. Flow. Alicia, how do you take time for yourself? Oh, man. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> um, it's been really hard this past year as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, last year I was, I was traveling. I was doing a lot of research. You know, part of my business with Yoke and Abundance is that we'll be leading retreats, and we've got a retreat coming up in Beaufort, North mm -hmm. Carolina, on the water. Um, so we hope that folks will come. We've got a lot of different price points for that to make it really accessible, but it's Cultivating Creativity Seaside. So last year I went on retreats as research to find out how people, other folks, what their idea of a retreat was, what an international retreat looked like, what's the content on those. And going on those, it was not only research, but it really filled me up. And not all, we can't always, I'm not in a position now where I can do that. Um, I blew that research budget last year. <laughs> but now, um, now the way I, I take time, you know, one of my favorite retreat leaders is a woman named Kimberly Wilson. She's been a mentor of mine over the years. And she always really, at the end of the retreat, asks you the question of how are you gonna take what you got and what you learned from these retreats into your daily life? And so for me, it's remembering that we get to choose the life we want to be living. And I can choose to sit down on my meditation cushion 
at the end of the night or sit up on my pillow in my bed at the end of the night and play a five minute guided meditation or sit and pay attention to my breath for five minutes or or I can choose to take a deep breath before I make a difficult phone call or I can choose to get up out of my chair between clients and go out to my garden and run my hands through the tomato vines and the rosemary bush and feel the perfumed smell of the garden on my skin before I go back or I can choose to go take a walk. Those things are really important to me. So it's not, yes, the big things like going on retreat are phenomenal, but what the feeling I got from retreat of learning how to take a breath in a moment and incorporating that by getting up and going to the garden or getting up and taking a walk is what's really important. Thank you. You're welcome. That's so inspirational. The idea of being able to take something as big as, you know, traveling to India during monsoon season. No that less. was not a retreat. That was to visit my sister. Fair. <laughs> but yes. Fair enough. Or a retreat to Greece. Yeah. One, yes. one of your favorite yoga instructors. Yeah. Being able to take little nuggets from that big experience and bring them back home in a very tactile, sensory way, being able to say... I can stop and pause for a breath and be mindful in this moment, even though I may not be on foreign soil. I have a way to cultivate that experience here in my in my home and my comfort zone, and keep that feeling going. Yes, it's a beautiful thing. Thanks. So, inquiring minds want to know. Oh yeah. What is a project that you're really excited to be working on? these days the first project is that retreat that I mentioned cultivating creativity seaside that's coming up in October the retreat part of my business is a part that I would certainly like to grow I think it is going on retreat and taking a pause from our daily life to look inward if you can afford it or if you can stow away the pennies to make that happen, I think that taking a pause is one of the most important things that you can do for yourself. And doing it in a way where you are held and you are taken care of and your needs are nourished, not just taken care of, but nourished, that there's good healthy food, that there's a balance of recreation and a really important piece to retreat, I think, is a good retreat gives you time for yourself. So how often is it that you actually get time away from home? You don't want it filled every hour, but you want some time to be able to take a nap if you want, go get a massage if you want. That I'm, I'm excited to deliver that experience to my clients and potential clients. I'm excited to gift that knowledge that I've been working on and cultivating for years now with other people. And I've gotten to do it once a while ago and I've even, you know, I've, I've, there are way more tools in my toolbox than there were at that point. And so I know that I can deliver a really curated experience for people that will allow them to relax, let go, create, and open to the possibility and magic that I so want and appreciate in my own life. So I'm beyond excited to share that. And it's worth mentioning to everyone who's listening right now that even though you can't see Alicia's face, you can probably hear the smile in her voice. And I'm here to tell you that I'm seeing it right now. She's really pumped about this experience coming up. So if you have a chance to sign up, take it. Please take it. What is something that most folks don't know about yoga and abundance or about Alicia Wolfert? Oh, goodness. Could be big, could be this little teeny tiny thing. You know, the the thing that I think a lot of people are surprised to learn about me is that I'm actually an introvert. So I'm I've always said I'm an introvert who chooses to be extroverted and being an 
introvert doesn't mean that you don't like being around people or things like that. Um, it just means that you recharge by being alone. And my friend Betsy, who I've now mentioned a few times, who she and I are partnering together on a lot of things, she's an extrovert. And so she has provided me with a lot of growth opportunities recently because <laughs> she's the type of person where she's got tons of people coming in and out of her life on a, ma on a regular basis. So if we're going to hang out and I think it's just going to be the two of us, I am sorely mistaken because even if we plan for it to be just the two of us, someone is popping in or out of the house at some point, whether she expected it or not expected it because she lives so wide open as the extrovert that she is. And it's a really beautiful thing. And it's, um, it's taught me to learn how to hold my boundaries as well. So she and I were, um, in Beaufort and at her family's house which is where we're holding this upcoming retreat and learning how to just say, no, I'm going to go take a nap now and be okay with that. I'm not hurting anyone and recognizing that that is 100% okay mm -hmm. and encouraged and celebrated. But being friend as an introvert, being such close friends with an extrovert um, and being encouraged to be who you are is a really beautiful thing. But I will say the way that that aspect of my personality, the way it plays into Yoke and Abundance as a company is hopefully a bonus for those that attend events with me. From a perspective of the Wise Women Wednesday panel, our friend raising events that we have, I want everyone who comes in the door to one of my events to feel included, welcomed, and a part of the community from the beginning. And I know that for me, going to an event where I don't know people can be a really uncomfortable thing and I have to go armed with questions that I can ask, that I can pull out of my back pocket when I need to, to help lubricate the conversation. And so I curate the events the Wise Women Wednesday events in such a way where I hope that you go home with a new friend, genuinely a new friend. So I plant questions, I plant fr friend raising activities. And you know, I want to say I use that term friend raising a lot, and it's not mine. Um, I don't know where <laughs> it really came from, but I know where I got it is I helped start a nonprofit way back in the day called Face to Face. And somebody threw that out for our community building events, that they were friend raising events. We did not want to call them networking events. And that has been something that has really stuck with me. And I just kind of want to give a shout out to my old face to face crew, anybody who might be listening, if they are, that I'm so grateful to have that language to share with people and to be able to, as an introvert, create a space that I hope is welcoming for other introverts. I think you pull that off very well. Thanks. In a, in, in a genuine way. That's the aim. Kudos to you. Thank you. Something that you like to ask on your Wise Women Wednesday blog, as well as the podcast, is what would you tell your younger self? But I want to add a little flair to this okay. question. <laughs> oh God, I'm scared. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. When you interviewed me, you asked, you made a point to ask my age. Yeah. And we talked about how sort of a taboo subject to ask a woman how old she is. I find it very liberating. Me too. So I'd love if you'd share your age. Yes. Now. And, yeah. um, the question that you'd ask your younger self, what age is this younger self that you're oh. speaking to? Okay, so I am 35, I'll be 36 in November, and I just keep like rounding up for some reason, like I'm on, the, like I feel like I'm always on the verge of calling myself 36. Um, like I can see the, the 40 hill, and, um, and, I, and age I think is a really interesting, beautiful thing. I mean, I've got role models in my life. My grandmother is 94. And she is, A, one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. Um, and 
she's not going to be listening to this, but in case she is, I just want to say that she's one of the most beautiful women. And she has these wrinkles that I just adore. And so to me, when I think about aging and I think about the woman that I want to be as I as I evolve I think about like if I could be as beautiful as she is when I'm that Mm -hmm. age that that would be such a privilege and an honor so that's always in the back of my head and she's always told me age is really just a number it really matters how you feel and so I'm I'm 35 and I feel I don't know 20s right but um The advice that I would give my younger self. I would give this advice to my graduating college self. And I would give this advice to my 25-year-old self. And I would give this advice to the person that I was, you know, seven years ago or so. But I think that the advice would be... I, I love hard, and I often don't let go of those that I love, emotionally speaking. And I think the advice would be, it's okay that you're not going to let go with them, but move on more quickly. Mm. Because all of that emotional energy that I spent pining over the death of a relationship and I've been lucky I've dated really incredible human beings and so it's when you've dated really incredible human beings it can be really difficult I think to let go Um, and I'm one person I, I really see the good in most people over the bad and there's like a quote about how it's important to have grace in letting go of things that don't belong to you. And I think that I knew in my heart that those humans didn't belong to me. And if I could have let that go, that energy could have been invested into work or hobbies or yoga or myself or reading or whatever. Um, and that those were painful lessons that I unfortunately had to learn more than once. Hmm. So keeping that same idea in mind, yeah. instead of looking at what you would tell your younger self, what would 35 going on 36-year-old Alicia say to maybe her 46-year-old self 10 years down the road? I would say I hope that the lessons where you're feeling shame, I hope that you've shared those with others and let those be a learning experience for those around you as well. And I would say, I hope that you love like you've never been hurt before. And that if you do get hurt, that you remember the lessons from earlier. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to let go. It's okay to let go. Love and let go. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really beautiful. My parents have been married for, it'll be 40 years next, this coming May. Um, I believe that's correct. And, you know, they met each other when my mom was 30 and my dad's four years younger than my mom. And they both say that they found the right person for one another. And I think that those that do find the right person are so lucky. And I think that it's a really unrealistic expectation these days that you are going to find one person and that you are going to have them for the rest of your life. We're just putting way too much on ourselves and on others, and it's not fair. And while I think it's such an accomplishment of what my parents have, they got really lucky. 
And so just reminding myself that it's okay that I haven't been lucky in love yet. 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 Yeah, Carol Dweck. <laughs> you know, she's a uh, growth mindset. <laughs> <laughs> what else would you like listeners to know about the work that you do or the life that you live day to day or anything that, you know, any words you'd like to leave with folks? I would just like folks to remember that whatever it is you're going through, no matter how hard the situation seems, there's two things that you can do. You can tell other people and you can reach out to the community members and you'll find out really quickly who's gonna help and who's not. And I think you might be surprised in a good way of who's there to help. And the other thing that I would say is that as bleak as it is, you can list out choices and you might not always like the choices that are in front of you, but you always, always, always have choices. Choices. Yes. And one more question. Yes. If someone, whether they're listening to this podcast episode or they've met you in passing or they've heard about you Mm -hmm. and they're not sure whether coaching is for them Mm. or not, you know, am I the right fit for coaching? Is coaching the right fit for me? What's your advice to them on how they make that determination? Do you have goals that you don't know how to get to? That would be my first question. And if you've got goals and you're not quite sure how to make them happen, absolutely coaching is for you. If you've got a goal and you feel a little bit stuck and you don't know why you're moving forward on it, we should definitely talk. If you have a business idea and you need a roadmap on how to make that happen and figure out if that's viable, we should definitely talk. If you have a business that you would like to see become more successful, then we should also talk. And it's probably for you. Those are the main main things. Thank you for clarifying yeah, that. Absolutely. Hopefully someone can glean something from that. And I would guess that even if someone is kinda sorta thinking about it, then it's probably a yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time thank and you so sharing much. all about your world with us. I know, you know, as human beings, we're naturally curious and, and well, I'll go ahead and own up to it a little bit nosy. And we want to know about yeah. the people who inspire us and know more about the voice behind this podcast. And it's great to get a, you know, a peek behind the curtain and see what you're all about. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that peek into me. If you're loving this podcast, help us spread the word. You can head over to iTunes and give us a review. Or remember, sharing is caring. Send this podcast to a friend who you think might love it. Check out our website, yokeandabundance.com, for more words of wisdom, creativity tips, and information about our group and individual coaching programs. You might even find a spot left for the October retreat I mentioned. Now, tell us about your wise moments from this week. When did you feel most wise? Tag us on Instagram with your wise moment for a chance to have your wise words shared on this podcast. Use the hashtag IamWise and hashtag Yoke and Abundance. Monica Barnett, founder of Monica Barnett Sewist, at mjb underscore makes had this to say yeah that crazy idea that i've been playing around with yeah i'm gonna do it and it's liberating i've been waiting around for something for years for no good reason the waiting has ended it's time to act thanks so much for sharing your wise words monica now a huge thank you to our sponsor social designs and our outstanding editor and producer iris sterling of Julia Sound Recordings. Remember, every one of us has wisdom within. Keep sharing your words of wisdom because you never know who you'll inspire.